Washington trying to contain another national security breach. Has the Biden administration been lying about the Ukraine conflict? And what happens next? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. The United States government is dealing with the fallout of yet another major leak of classified papers. Among the revelations, U.S. skepticism about Ukraine's military abilities in the current conflict with Russia and U.S. intelligence agencies spying on allies. A 21-year-old member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard was arrested for posting the documents on Discord, a social media platform. We begin with this report from CGTN's Nathan King. Jack to Sarah facing uh, court for the first time. Uh, now, if convicted, he could face up to 15 years in prison. There'll be another hearing on Wednesday. He did not plead, uh, enter a plea. Uh, two charges he is facing, pretty similar uh, sounding, but essentially unauthorized retention and transmission of national defense information and uh, unauthorized removal of classified documents or material. Uh, he uh, said, love you, Dad, as he was led away. His father said the same thing to him. It is a dramatic turnaround for a 21-year-old who was unheard of just a few days ago. The media essentially tracked him down uh, first of all, and then the FBI coming in, uh, the, and others coming in for that dramatic uh, arrest. Uh, there has been a response from the White House uh, after this. Joe Biden, of course, coming back from Ireland this weekend, saying commend the rapid action taken by enforcement. Uh, and investigate, uh, respond the recent dissemination of classified government documents. They're still determining, he says, the validity, validity of those documents, uh, essentially saying if they're real or not, and directing the military intelligence community to take steps to further secure and limit distribution. Essentially, less people are going to get access to this intelligence, because this is quite incredible. He was 21 years old. He's had access for about over a, a year, these top secret documents, but he's not high up. He's not on the fast track promotion. Essentially, he looks after the service. He's a tech guy more than an intelligence guy. And uh, uh, prosecutors essentially think this is part of his motivation for putting it out on Discord, that gaming platform where his fellow gun enthusiasts gathered. Uh, essentially trying to teach people, show that perhaps he was more important than he actually was. All these motives, of course, will be playing out in a trial. But he wasn't seemingly political uh, or had uh, ideology like Edward Snowden, uh, uh, Chelsea Manning and others. Very much showing off. Uh, almost in a sort of social uh, media way. This is the uh, times that we live in. But obviously, with uh, so many people with access to these sorts of documents since the war on terror, there's going to be real changes here at the Pentagon and across the national security establishment. Nathan King, CGTN, just outside the Pentagon. Well, to discuss this and more, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from New York, Brian Becker is the executive director of the ANSA Coalition. Here in Washington, D.C., Anton Fedyashin is a professor of history at American University. Joseph Williams is a former senior editor in U.S. News and World Report. And from New Jersey, we're joined by Chris Hedges. He is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. Welcome to all of you to the show. Chris Hedges, um, these documents have been around for some time on social media platforms as well as messaging platforms. They tell us uh, a little bit about the conflict in Ukraine um, and the Russian conduct of this conflict as well. They also reveal that the United States continues to spy on adversaries as well as allies. Now, regardless of the circumstances of how these documents were released or the role that the 21-year-old National Air Guardsman had to play in this, what do you make of what these documents tell us? I would say they do two things, the points that you just raised. Uh, remember that the WikiLeaks publications uh, go back to the Iraqi war logs we saw that the U.S. government was spying on all sorts of allies. The U.N. Uh, Secretary General, uh, the Angela Merkel's phone, etc. Uh, so there's that, uh, primarily Korea. Uh, and then also the very bleak assessment about the war in Ukraine. That doesn't come particularly as a surprise to those of us who covered conflicts. I spent 20 years overseas, most of them with The New York Times, covering various conflicts around the globe. Uh, the every red line the Biden administration put down in terms of weapon systems they've crossed almost immediately. And now they're talking about, of course, 
fighter jets. I think Poland has already sent some. So, and this is just a kind of hail Mary, a war of attrition. Uh, they, they can't win. Uh, Russia has certainly taken heavy losses. Uh, but again, from these documents, we see that the losses on the Ukrainian side are far higher. I think it was 120,000 or something, far higher uh, than had been uh, publicly acknowledged. So uh, it, it, it confirms what a lot of us have been reporting and, and writing uh, and uh, fits the kind of pattern of U.S. surveillance. There's nothing particularly shocking uh, that came out in these documents. All right, Chris, the other thing was these documents also tell us that the United States has been spying on uh, its adversaries, as it uh, does, as well as allies, including Israel and South Korea. And you mentioned the United Nations Secretary General. Well, it's also been monitoring conversations that uh, the Secretary General has been holding with his staff, pri uh, private conversations, uh, which, as I understand it, is a violation of international law. Um, are there going to be repercussions for this, or is the world just now except the fact that the United States is going to continue with this kind of spying? Well, there were no repercussions from the revelations that there was widespread spying on the eve of the invasion of Iraq of not just the uh, U.N. Secretary General, but all sorts of U.N. diplomats uh, to make sure that there was no resolution opposing the invasion. There were no repercussions at all. So I don't expect any. Uh, obviously, there's a certain disquiet, uh, probably among the Israelis and the South Koreans, uh, but I don't think there's much they're going to do about it, and they're probably not terribly surprised about it as well. Brian Baker, what these documents tell us about the conduct of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia is very different from what Biden administration's officials have been saying in public. Have these officials effectively been lying? Uh, I don't think you could come to any other conclusion. Uh, you know, it's an old cliche that the first casualty in any war is the truth. Uh, this is an instance where the, the truth has been trashed over and over again, even before February 24, 2022, when, when the Russians took the decision to militarily intervene, intervene in, in Ukraine. Uh, what we see here and what we can tell clearly from the documents is that this is a, a war in which hundreds of thousands of people are either dying or being terribly wounded uh, with life-changing injuries. We're seeing that huge parts of Ukraine, especially the eastern part of Ukraine, which has been the subject of military conflict since 2014, almost nine years now, or a little bit more than nine years, uh, it's completely devastated. And, you know, the U.S. media missed the story. Instead of focusing on the, the sort of false presentation about what the war is and how this is a noble cause and it's going great and Ukrainians are united and, you know, victory is at hand and there's no real urgent need to negotiate, the U.S. media focused all of its attention on this 21-year-old and the capture of him and how dramatic it was when, when you had U.S. media actually functioning as the investigators tracking down who the leaker might have been, uh, the same media that would presumably, if he had been a source providing that kind of information to the New York Times, they would have, they would have protected him or they should have, but instead they became sort of like the bloodhounds to, to find him. It's a missed story. The whole war has been misreported by the American media in a terrible way. This is, I would say, one more instance. Brian, these documents also tell us that there are American forces that are operating on the ground in Ukraine. Special forces are there uh, in Ukraine. And now, the Pentagon has pushed back at this and says, look, there are American forces in Ukraine, but what they're doing is what they do in almost uh, every other country, and that is they are safeguarding uh, diplomatic facilities, the embassy in Ukraine. What are we to make of this? Well, I think that's absolute nonsense. There's no possible way that the Ukrainian military in a confrontation, a drawn out confrontation with Russia that has gone on for almost a year, could have maintained any semblance of having success here or there on the battlefield if they weren't under the direction, supervision of the United States, its Pentagon, its intelligence services. It's not just that the U.S. is sending 150 or 160 billion dollars of weapons. This is a Pentagon war. But the American people are, are being told that it's a Ukrainian war for liberation, when in fact it's a proxy war 
against Russia. The American government is waging war with Russia. There could have been an easily negotiated settlement to this, and there still could be, actually. The U.S. wanted this, but as long as Ukrainians do all the bleeding, then the American people won't create a massive anti-war movement, as happened in, in Vietnam or in Iraq. So the American government cynically is using Ukrainians to carry out a proxy war. And again, the media has not actually told the American people the truth about this. And on for the ocean, um, I mean, these documents do give us some insight into what is really happening on the battlefield uh, in Ukraine right now. For instance, we learned that uh, Ukraine really has no air defenses uh, right now. And in fact, one very senior Ukrainian military intelligence official described the situation in Bakhmut, where we have seen some of the fiercest fighting in recent months. He described it as catastrophic. In general, uh, it paints a picture of Ukraine, which is at odds with what we have been hearing in public. Um, what does that tell us about the battlefield situation? Anand, um, unfortunately, in the uh, Western mainstream media, um, the difference between condemning this war or criticizing this war has, uh, and on, on one hand, and then um, realizing what the reality is on the battlefield, the line between these two things has been intentionally uh, erased. And that's why people who um, may feel uh, very strongly about the legality and all sorts of other things about the horrors going on on the ground um, have been confused into believing that the Ukrainians are winning this conflict. The reality on the ground, of course, for the grim realists, uh, uh, those of us who are grim realists, who have been following this fairly carefully and distinguishing between publicity and reality, the reality on the ground is very bleak for the Ukrainians. This is less of a stalemate that we're seeing on the ground, that it is a war of attrition. Chris mentioned this earlier, and I agree with him uh, fully, and the Russians have more resource, resources to uh, burn through. Um, I, I don't think that this that the Ukrainians are, are going to make a major breakthrough uh, with the um, offensive that they are uh, planning. Uh, the Russians are taking this offensive seriously, by the way, they are preparing for it, but this is what makes uh, the possibility of its success uh, even smaller. And supposing the Ukrainians even do, let's say, retake 100 square miles of yeah. uh, territory, um, I don't see exactly what difference this is going to make. The Russians are certainly not going to be sitting back and twiddling their thumbs while this is happening. So I, I think we're moving towards some kind of resolution of this conflict this spring, probably in the summer. But I think what, what's clear is that the Ukrainians are uh, aiming to make some kind of breakthrough, because in July, there's a NATO summit in Vilnius. And as Foreign Minister Kuleva of Ukraine has stated, uh, the Ukrainians very seriously intend to be invited into NATO without any preconditions or even a roadmap. And unfortunately, I don't actually see that happening. Yeah, and Anton, this offensive that you talk about, I mean, there's been much in the American state-supported media about this offensive. They've been talking about it for weeks right now, and that Ukraine will mount this counter-offensive to try and regain territory that's been taken by Russia. Looking at these revelations and the fact that we now know that Ukraine doesn't have much of an air defense capability, does that change anything? I mean, this, of course, also presumes that Russia didn't know about this. Well, the Russians, of course, knew about this because they're the reason why the Ukrainians don't have much of an air capability. And that explains the repeated waves of, um, of attacks uh, on Ukraine over the past multiple months. It explains also why the Russians bothered uh, buying drones from Iran, because in many cases they were simply tricking the Ukrainian defenses into doing what any country's defenses, of course, would do in this situation, which is to... Uh, shoot down incoming um, vessels, but in the process, w wasting um, mm -hmm. their uh, their uh, ammunition. Um, unfortunately, the control that the Russians have on of the air in Ukraine m makes the possibilities of a Ukrainian success on the land um, increasingly more uh, more bleak. Um, I, I I do not see a positive outcome of the in, in this. Uh, for Ukraine, unfortunately.
Joseph Williams, of course, we've not, uh, this is not the first time we've seen a leak of this kind, but what do you make of this leak that we've seen actually unfold over quite a few weeks? It's been quite remarkable. I mean, not the least of which the fact that a lot of the documents were hiding in plain sight and that, yeah, the American media missed a lot of what was already out there, mainly because it, you know, they don't have a typically have it don't typically have a habit of monitoring gaming uh, websites and uh, those sorts of things for actual news because it rarely surfaces there. But it speaks to uh, a couple of really disturbing trends. The first is that 18, 19, and 20 year olds are being trusted with this kind of information. I mean, granted, the uh, leaker was a technician uh, who had access to, uh, he was basically like your IT guy at a National Guard base where there really probably wasn't a whole lot of of, of things for him to do aside fix the computers and maybe snoop around. But the mere fact that these documents got out into the open, that there was a breach of trust and that there was no solid background checking on this young man uh, because he had a lot of worrisome practices that should have been red flags to the military. Now, on, on the terms of how much of, of a difference is going to make in combat, it's really hard to say at this point, uh, mainly because um, the, the, my understanding of the documents is that it basically it provides a snapshot in time. Now, conditions on the ground probably haven't approved or deteriorated all that much, but certainly it's an embarrassment to the Biden administration, and it's something that uh, he's going to have to repair as he goes around the world uh, talking about the war, and it's something he's going to have to reconcile with how the American public feels about the war in Ukraine, given the fact that there's been a lot of rosy predictions on how this is going to turn out. Yeah, on that question of how the American public feels, uh, Joseph, um, I mean, you pointed out that these are 18, 19, 20, and in this case, a 21-year-old who have access to these documents. I mean, what is the public going to feel about th that fact, that, you know, documents about the conduct of war that is taking place right now? It's not some war that took place years ago. It's taking place right now. How are they going to feel about how the military and the administration handles this? Well, there's been a lot of backsliding or softening in support for the Ukraine war. I mean, back in uh, March, April of 2022, the American public was all in, uh, as President Biden was. And since then, there's been kind of a, a, an abject fatigue over the fact that there has not been any real breakthrough by the quote-unquote good guys, uh, the Ukrainians in this situation, that the war is grinding on for year after year after year. The Republicans are making a lot of noise about the fact that tens of billions of dollars in military hardware and aid has been shuffled to the Ukrainians with no clear discernible result in, in what we're getting for that money. And it's going to be very much a talking point uh, heading into the fall primaries or heading into the primary season over the, the winter, uh, the late fall and into the winter. There's going to be a lot of Republicans talking about it. They're looking for anything to hit Joe Biden on. And I think they might have at least a, a hint of a winning strategy here. Right, and on that question of, of tens of billions of dollars being sent to Ukraine, there was some great reporting by Seymour Hirsch in one of his latest reports in which he said there's also been a lot of skimming that's been going on on those funds, skimming on the part of Ukrainian leaders and uh, Ukrainian politicians. Uh, Chris Hedges, um, if we look at the response from the White House, the White House says that it is concerned, that's the word they use, quote unquote, concerned. President Biden said the revelations are not of, quote, great consequence. I mean, what are we to read into this? Is this just a big shrug by the administration? Uh, does it also tell us that the White House is not even remotely concerned, even if it broke the law? Well, no, I think they're concerned. We have to remember you have 1.25 million people have access to top secret documents. This is something Edward Snowden pointed out. Uh, these leaks are uh, going to become inevitable. I also want to speak as a former investigative reporter for the New York Times that uh, essentially because of wholesale surveillance and the misuse of the Espionage Act against whistleblowers, it's become impossible uh, outside of these kinds of hacks and leaks to shine a light on the inner workings of power. That's why a figure like Julian Assange is so important journalistically. Uh, and, and those that have carried out these leaks, Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, Jeremy Hammond and other, others have really been uh, ruthlessly persecuted. Uh, Julian, of course, is not an American citizen. Uh, WikiLeaks is not a U.S.-based publication. And yet, of course, he is 
uh, the Biden administration, starting with the Trump administration, is attempting to extradite him. Uh, this is the first time they've used the Espionage Act against a journalist. Obama used it, uh, I think, eight or nine times against people who leaked to journalists, whistleblowers. So it's part of this kind of war on the press and shutting down any uh, ability to uh, take a, a look or allow the public to see the machinery of power. So if they hadn't managed to catch him, uh, they, they got him and they got him quickly. And of course, as the point was made, unfortunately, uh, the press uh, was enthusiastically part of the posse to essentially go after him. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, and, and I don't think that uh, there were any huge surprises uh, in the leaks at all. Uh, uh, there was there was nothing. Uh, there was no, nothing that I think could bring down the Biden administration. Is not Iran contra or anything. Yeah. Brian, uh, looking further at the role that the media has played in this, uh, it was not the police or the country's security services that fingered. Jack Teixeira, that's the 21-year-old who released these documents, but it was journalists on two of the country's most prominent newspapers, the Washington Post and the New York Times, uh, that fingered this young man. Um, I mean, instead of lauding the fact that Teixeira actually shone a bright light into a very dark place and what was happening on the battlefield in Ukraine, he was targeted. Yeah, it's, it's really shocking. It's emblematic, though, that the New York Times, the Washington Post, the CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, conservative or liberal alike, the mainstream media, in essence, functions as an echo chamber uh, for war propaganda in the United States. You never see a contrary point of view. Really, you don't. I mean, there's some little debates about tactics, but nothing about the essence of the position, about the idea that the U.S. is 100 percent committed to this proxy war with Russia. And at the same time, the New York Times, in this case, disgracefully uh, spent all of its energy not talking about what the documents showed and how the American people are being lied to, but to reveal the identity of the leaker so he could be captured. In other words, the New York Times sees itself and these media outlets see themselves really as an extension of American state power. You know, they tell the rest of the world, oh, we're the free press, we're the independent media, we're not state owned. But they function really as the bloodhounds for the state. And again, if you come out with a contrarian point of view, you'll also be demonized by these same uh, media outlets as if you're a friend of, of the Kremlin or a friend of Putin. If you say, well, wait a second, is this really a good idea? Is major power conflict really a good idea? Is spending $150 billion for a war that doesn't need to happen and could easily be negotiated, a settlement could be negotiated? by allowing Ukraine to be neutral rather than part of NATO. It, instead of the media doing that, it's really just an extension of American power and the hypocrisy, the double standard, where they lecture the rest of the world about how America is great because the press is actually free. It's not free. It's an extension of American state power. Anton Fedyashin, looking at the broader implications of leaks like this, I mean, they do tell us that the United States has this awesome ability to penetrate uh, the uh, security of other countries. I mean, in this instance, they, it indicates that they've penetrated uh, Russia, for instance, probably way up into the upper reaches of the Kremlin. But given all of this, I mean, it's very impressive when you look at it. What is the, what has that actually achieved for the United States? I mean, it constantly gets itself into wars. Intelligence like this should be able to prevent it getting into wars, but it's constantly in wars, and wars that it doesn't actually emerge as a victor. Well, Anand, um, before I answer your question, just very quickly, I, I didn't see any proof uh, about uh, the United States having very high level sources in the Russian political establishment. I, I've heard the claims, by yeah. the way, um, and they sound to me like a, an attempt to sort of deflect attention from what's actually in the documents. If the United States had had uh, such high place sources, I don't think so many things uh, that uh, would have come as a surprise about uh, uh, both the uh, action in Ukraine and everything uh, before that. And by the way, uh, of the things that are mentioned in the documents that the United States knew about, such as particular strikes, uh, all of that can be intercepted through uh, ELAN, uh, electronic uh, 
um, surveillance uh, in which the United States really does have absolutely awesome um, uh, capabilities, and no one should be surprised about that. Right. Now, to the bigger picture of what you were uh, asking about, um, the United States is structurally still the dominant um, uh, player in the world. And it looks to me like it is desperately trying to hold on to that position, although all around it, and one has to be either blind or clinically insane not to notice this, all around um, the relative decline of the United States has begun. Now, this is not to say that it's about to collapse or any of the silliness that, uh, that you occasionally hear, but there is a relative decline of the United States uh, versus the other great powers, especially uh, China and India. Yeah. Uh, and now the other great powers are beginning to cooperate with each other. In other words, that they are getting closer to each other than any of them is to Washington. That, I think, is the most important, bigger uh, picture here. And the United States doesn't seem to be going out of its way to actually mitigate this through intelligent, nuanced uh, diplomacy. What we see is espionage, mm -hmm. sanctions, uh, some bullying here and there. Uh, but I, I really don't see the adults in the room actually mm -hmm. taking care to manage imperial decline. Joseph Williams, um, you know, as I said earlier on, this is not the first time we've seen a leak of this kind. I and mean, if we look at some of the major leaks in the past, there was the Pentagon Papers leak, uh, the original Pentagon Papers, that is. Daniel Ellsberg uh, released those documents. Uh, Julian Assange, of course, the WikiLeaks um, documents. Then there was Edward Snowden. Um, is this very different from those leaks? It is and it isn't. Uh, and it also depends on who you talk to. I mean, it is in that it reveals some very sensitive information about an ongoing uh, land war that has a lot of consequences for the people who are fighting it. Uh, but it isn't in that it wasn't malicious or it wasn't to shed a light on anything. I mean, it did inadvertently. Mm -hmm. um, and it is because uh, it describes how the United States is, is elbows deep into something that's going to cost and it's going to be costly over the long run. Um, now, there, there are a couple quick things. I mean, I, I do want to take exception with the fact that the, that the media has not used these documents. I mean, certainly I've been seeing headlines for the last two weeks about mm. the revelations in the documents and how they've reflected badly um, on the United States position in the war, um, as well as reflecting on uh, the fact that Ukraine is still going to be in a position that yeah. is right now that's going to be a, a, a stagnant war that is probably going to end up in the stalemate. So I do want to right. defend my colleagues on at least that front. Okay. Uh, and, and secondarily, I believe that, that more leaks and more information and the fact that the United States is going full bore after this young man, yeah. uh, when we have uh, probably more people, you know, Donald Trump certainly had doc, classified documents, right. and he has yet to be in, uh, in the dock at all for any of the documents that he had in his hole. So I think that the power imbalance very clearly is on display here. Okay. Uh, but I think that it's going to continue to happen. More leaks are going to continue to happen as this goes on. On. Right, we have to leave it there. Time has caught up with us. Thanks to all of you for being with us. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thank you for watching.